so in this study, kind of in the, in, again in the first seven and a half seconds, incredibly crude, but there's there's no hint of like a visual simulation area being active in the first seven and a half seconds. Um, but we don't have any specification on uh, what controls the partialness of the of the simulation. So without without saying it has a very steep drop off or a very shallow drop off, you don't know how to predict what should be seen in activation. When. Well, what we, I, I haven't shown it here, but we actually had a, a word association localizer task. So at, at the end, of, actually on a separate day, the subjects came back and we gave them words and had them generate word associates. And we, we took those areas and they're, they're areas that are classically found in word association areas like, the, like Broca's area and certain areas in the cerebellum. Um, and um, basically, you know, when we look at the first seven and a half seconds where we argue they haven't quite gotten to the simulation as strongly, that's, those are the only areas we see activation. We also had a second kind of localizer, which was we gave them the same words. Actually, it was all counterbalanced between subjects. They each saw a word once, but um, they, got, they, they would get words and they would have to simulate an experience of being in the situation. And basically, that, that's, the, that's the mask that's being used for the second seven and a half seconds. And so um, what, when you look at that mask for the first seven and a half seconds, you see nothing active, um, suggesting that, um, that they aren't doing any simulation in the first seven and a half seconds. So, um, you know, I, I, um, if you actually go back and look at this paper with, with Solomon, um, there, there, is, there is some evidence of, of simulations being active very early. If you actually look at some of the error trials where some of the, the word association strengths are lower, uh, you know, so I'm, I'm very sympathetic to your arguments, but I actually really have come to believe, you know, this was not what we started out believing. We were driven to this position by the data and by other arguments in the literature. Um, but I, but I'm as, as sympathetic as I am to your arguments and to the importance of simulation, I, I, I think there is something to this idea that people just pull up word representations that can get use them in a heuristic way to generate responses. One of the things that I found really interesting here was uh, the task effects right, throughout the, the data that you presented. So in, in relation to this, to the task is, is kind of a word generation task. Right? So you can imagine that there is a attentional or executive pressure on the linguistic system to operate more efficiently. Yeah. So what if you had a task that was much more visually driven, let's say? So like a visual search task, a guided visual search task, right? So like now find the B. And there are things in the display that are visually similar to the B or bear some kind of visual relationship, right? So that might change, you know, the, the relationship between the temporal relationship. Right, yeah. That's a great idea. Um, I guess that would fit with some of the experiments that we were talking about earlier today. Um, yeah, no, I, I mean, we view the conceptual, I didn't talk about this today, but we, we think the conceptual system's a dynamic system, a concept is a dynamic system, and it's just exquisitely sensitive to its adaptation history, the current conditions, and that the time course, there's no, not going to be any one fixed time course. It's going to be bouncing around all over the place as a function of all sorts of variables. And, um, it, and I agree, it would be really, and I don't really know of anybody who's kind of looked at these same kinds of questions using visual stimuli, and I think that would be um, a great thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if you look for predictable variability in individual differences at all. So, you know, on, in terms of things like people saying how much or little they're likely to engage in mental imagery or can do that, you think that sort of thing predicts uh, these sort of arts and differences across subjects and maybe, maybe even create yeah, like in this, in all of our first experiments, we conducted post-experiment interviews about how much imagery the subjects were experiencing, and, and there are two interesting findings from those. Um, we haven't continued doing it. I think we just ran out of energy, but um, the um, one thing we found is that if you ask people after a task like this, and we even had, there were, I didn't, there were other conditions where we actually explicitly asked people to use imagery. Even in those conditions, people don't experience imagery even close to all of the time. What they report is having kind of flashes of imagery in all of these conditions, um, but that, you know, never anything like a continuous simulation. Um, the other finding is that those reports don't correlate either with individuals or with the conditions. Um, now, you know, we, we, maybe we didn't do it right, maybe we haven't done it enough, but um, it just kind of, it, we came away thinking that people really didn't have a good you know, subjective access to what was actually happening. But 
I guess kind of the other thing we came with, away with is just thinking that a lot of this, because we cons everybody consistently gets evidence for simulation, that a lot of this stuff is happening unconsciously, and people don't have good conscious access to it. Yes? One more question. Um, so uh, I, I, what you said about um, the fact that we, we've historically studied abstract concepts and these very using these very shallow tasks is true of concrete concepts, too, yes. and certainly in the neuroimaging literature. Yep. So I'm curious, in your study um, uh, where you, where you uh, uh, induce deep processing for both abstract and concrete words, what are the concrete, what are the effects for concrete for words look like? That is to say, do you replicate Alex Martin's category um, uh, yes. effects um, yep. even with deep situational context? Yeah, I mean, the... Um Let's see, was it, who was that? No, I, I guess it was later. Um, the um, a problem in a lot of these studies is just you're subtracting out so much with various control conditions. You To really get the full situational thing, you have to... We're actually, like with this stu these studies here with, with Lisa and, and um, Christy, um, we're trying harder to get the entire situation, and what we tend to find is just stuff is active all over the brain. So, like it for, like when we we're really actually what this experiment is really looking at is fear and anger, and whether there are situational effects. Because most theories of emotion argue that, you know, emotion is a discrete, you know, system in the brain that ballistically becomes active when the conditions are there. And we have a very different theory of emotion, a much more conceptual theory of, and dynamic theory of emotion, which argues that whenever you experience an emotion, you construct that a very situated representation that is um, kind of controlling everything about, about the experience, but we're, so we're trying to measure those representations using imaging. And, um, what, and, and we're trying to set up baselines so we can pick up uh, all those different areas, and what we're uh, are using various kinds of um, designs to pick those things up. Um, and what we're finding is kind of activation all over the brain. So we'll get you know, parahippocampal gyrus active for settings, we'll get motor and somatosensory areas active, insula, medial prefrontal for mental states, the motor system, visual motion areas. Um, um, I mean, generally, it seems like what, you know, people are kind of, they're kind of just all of the relevant situational information across all the modalities that is needed to kind of understand that concept in a situated way is, be, is becoming active. Um, we also have done a... Um, I, I didn't. I can. I can show you these results later if you like. Um, I don't have them in this slide set, but we did a study on. Con actually, it's from. It's from that same. It's from the same experiment. That th this experiment here is actually a study on conceptual combination, and this is just from the control condition. But when you actually look at um, these are modifiers. When you look at the head nouns that follow, um, when they're processed in a conceptual combination, the entire brain becomes active to represent a situation, including the parahippocampus. For settings, motor, somatosensory, motion, um, all sorts of visual areas. Um, but in general, when P and the argument is that when you have to combine, like, one of, like so one of the, the conceptual combinations is distressed reverend. And what we show is that when you process reverend in isolation compared to when you process distressed reverend, and, and again, we're using a methodology where we're deconvolving out the, the first word. When you just look at the activation for reverend, when it's in, in this combination, as opposed to when it's processed in isolation, that's when you see all those areas I just described, all the situational activation. And it's like, in order to combine distressed with reverend, you've got to situate it. And, and when you just give reverend by itself, you don't see all that stuff active. And so, yeah, I, you know, I think it's, that's a really interesting thing to do. And what we're increasingly trying to do, if you have any ideas about, other ideas about how to get, go, go about it, I'd love to hear them. But I thought, Marner, you just quickly, your implication was really, and maybe I misunderstood, but you know, if some of the studies like the Chow and Martin right. study that has been cited six million times, right. that when people passively observe tools, they get sensory motor right. activation. Oh. <laughs> so, um, so, but on this, on your account, that that deep processing is actually not necessary. I mean, it, you could argue that you could get by understanding the concept of these. Uh, of these objects or words with, with the linguistic processing alone. Now, these were pictures. That's what I was just going to okay. say. Yeah. So when you come, this gets back yeah. to what you were saying, yeah. when you come through a pictorial, exactly. maybe you have a much faster and easier access yeah. to the 
And going back to that glossary view, I mean, you show people, if you, show, if you do plastic like just, you know, chair, table, doctor, nurse kind of semantic priming, you know, with words you get like a 30 millisecond effect. When you use pictures, you get like an 80 or 90 millisecond effect. I mean, it's like the pictures just activate conceptual structures so much more strongly and automatically. And, um, yeah. But that comes back to, to John's point, because suppose you saw the same effects in a somewhat less uh, strong, more muted effect right. with words. Yeah. It, it still would be the same principle that this is this this activation, as Paul Munger pointed out, this act, it's yeah. spread throughout the system whether yeah. you want it to or not. Yeah. And, and then it becomes a question, John's notion was yeah. that it's just a matter of solving it with the easiest, most uh, readily yeah. accessible information. Exactly. So that would, it, it, uh, you don't need to invoke the difference yeah. between pictures and words. Yeah. I mean, these times, this, yeah. this activation spreads throughout the system, yeah. and depending on yeah. the task at hand, if you really make yeah. them make the task difficult, that you're talking about this angry reverend, frustrated reverend, yeah. whatever, something that's that uh, involves a very complex scenario, they're going to yeah. simulate to a much greater degree than if it's something right. more... Uh, superficial, yeah. so it becomes a sort of depth of processing yeah. kind of account. Yeah. I mean, it's really interesting what Glosser's account was of kind of like the doctor nurse kind of priming sort of thing. You know, when you, so you get like maybe 30 millisecond priming for words, but you go up to maybe 80 or 90 when you give pictures. And what he argued is that, is that in, a, in the linguistic form system, you have associations, say, between doctor nurse, table chair, the thematic or taxonomic relations that exist that can produce priming but that they're weaker than the ones that exist in, say, the conceptual system or the image-based system. And what he argued was that um, when you get things like Dr. Nurse, that um, what you primarily do is use the linguistic form system, but it may trickle over somewhat into the conceptual system, so you may be getting contributions from both, but because it doesn't really engage that system as much, you primarily get the contribution from the linguistic form system. But basically, he was arguing, in general, you can get various mixtures of the two systems. It's not just all or one. Um, and so, you know, I, I suspect that in general, you do get some conceptual, something from the simulation system. It's just not as much as if you had a deeper task where you're giving people pictures. Well, thank you very much. Great, great questions.